Poem number one, Sitting in the Asters. The New England Aster is rumored to be decongesting, antispasmodic, and relaxing to the lungs, and can be used to relieve colds and seasonal allergies and asthma, according to a website I have never heard of. I was unaware of all of this as I sat in the Asters, breathing deep, thinking about you, reader, and what this poem might be worth to you, as my efforts are opposite the Aster, I want to leave you breathless, which, I guess, learning what I have learned about the subject of this poem, might be impossible were you to read this poem sitting in the Asters. Poem number two. Oh, and the prompt. Oh, and poem like number two. The no, I can do it. Okay. Why is Robin the superior superhero to Batman? This is a tough one. Poem number two is called Robin over Batman. In the 1998 DC Batman storyline called A Death in the Family, Jason Todd Dick Grayson's replacement as Robin is killed by the Joker in Batman's city. Killed dead. No immortal pool to dip him in to bring him back. No talisman, no spell, no far-flung magic garden to replenish young Todd's green. Todd dies on Batman's watch. Todd dies, the Joker gets away, and Batman is left to carry Robin's bloodied and partially exploded body out of the wreckage. Robin, then, the superior superhero, being the only one in the world who can teach the world's greatest detective that sometimes you just lose. Poem number three, the prompt is cross-cultural, and in brackets, aka worldviews, and marriage. Why stay and why go? So poem number three is titled, fittingly, Why Stay and Why Go? How many of us don't do both? But yes, the tension can really be a sports boat gaining holes Best to swim through, dip your head under every now and then, and be alone with it. What's the current today saying? Actually, maybe best not to think about that. Think of the many things your love is bigger than. If you can't see its size, it might be time to leave the lake, travel elsewhere. Remember the speedboat from earlier in the poem? Power can be a getaway. When unevenly distributed, there's gas in the water. All this to say, I hope you soon find peace on the lake. No loon call of mass destruction. Yep, here, here we go. Here we go. The reading of the poem. Reading of the poem. Let's do this. Okay. Okay, poem number four and cover number four. And I will read the prompt beforehand. I'll read the entire prompt. It's not too long. All poets are liars. According to Plato's theory of mimesis, the arts deal with illusion and they are imitation of an imitation. Thus, they are twice removed from reality. As a moralist, Plato disapproves of poetry because it is immoral. As a, a philosopher, he disapproves of it because it is based in falsehood. I copied that straight from Wikipedia. And found this other quote from John Cocteau. The poet is a liar who always speaks the truth. That's the problem. The poem is titled, All Poets Are Liars. If only poets could be twice removed from reality, especially these days. The difference between poets and philosophers is, philosophers study the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence. Poets, on the other hand, study the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence but aren't damn fool enough to think our work belongs in some textbook on how to live. Jean Cocteau once said, the poet is a liar who always speaks the truth. What a textbook liar. Oh. Oh. 
They're up. Poem number five. Uh, I'm going to read the prompt first. A girl who lives in a magical land called Karth. Karth is associated with the element Earth. And then she finds this lamp in her grandmother's closet, and it shines a really big light, and she is transported to Earth. Poem number five, called Dimensions of a Closet. Zarth, Yarth, Zarth, Warth, Varth, Yuarth, Tarth, Sarth, Rarth, Quarth, Parth, Orth, Narth. Marth, Larth, Karth, you were here. Jarth, Iarth, Harth, Garth, Farth, Earth, you are here. Good luck. Darth, Sarth, Barth, Arth. That's it. Prompt? The time of the bell is one o'clock. I will read the prompt, and I will read the poem. Uh, so this is one of those, if you watched our live stream on Monday, this is one of those prompts that we received that contains some personal information. So, but there's a lot of, uh, I want to read as much of the prompt as I can without uh, mentioning that information because I, uh, I, I'm i kind of riffing on some of the language in the prompt, so I'm going to read from it what I can. Uh, this is kind of one of the more difficult ones for many reasons. Um, so, the prompt is, I would like to see a poem about how trauma and mental health affect friendships. How the strong ones find a way to survive and become closer, and the weak ones show cracks and crumble away. I couldn't have made it through without the strong friendships, and I know how hard it must have been for others to watch me go through it, not know what to say, have awkward conversations due to my debilitating anxiety, but still make an effort. So this poem is called Know This, and this is poem number six. It is very rare for me to be left speechless, as you well know, but that's how your efforts have left me. I know that if I was in need, you would be all lights and sirens. I know that. I'm sorry if, as you were in need, I didn't make you know that. You're still here, more here than maybe ever before, because there never is any going back. But at least that means I still have time to prove it. Make you know that because I don't ever want our bond just to survive. Just know that every crack that moves to separate us will move us to become even closer. <clears throat> Poem number seven, cover number seven. Uh, the prompt for this one was Short and sweet, two words, desiccated slash elevated. And uh, I decided to go for a um, kind of revelation, modern revelation kind of poem, uh, kind of concentrating more on desiccated than elevated, but anyhow, I'll just get to it. It's called Revel Elevation. An elevated need to get the fuck off the earth. I have this memory that is most likely incorrect of watching the ticker on CNN on 9-11 and as the tumult grew, a ticker headline ticked that read something like, Stephen Hawking says we need to start making plans to evacuate the earth. He always was a prescient one. Fresh water retreating from poorer shores, the worms tucking back into the earth, Birds are testing their intuitive understanding of how high, though maybe they're just trying to teach these green billionaires. One definition of desiccated is to drain of emotional or intellectual vitality, which is why I lie down in the shower now, don't want my river to run dry. 
Let's not let all this husk, all good we've done, all bad, all unknowing the great finality of green and blue, this god dot, this warming room, our brief history and time. Let's feed all this broken resolve to every Moloch preaching the new prime. There we are. Third of the way through. Here we go. Third of the way. Uh, the prompt for this one, for poem number eight, cover number eight, is labyrinth. One word. And I think when most people hear that, they think one of two things, a maze or the David Bowie uh, vehicle <laughs> labyrinth. So I decided to go with the latter, and this is called Labyrinth. And uh, I will give a shout out to Shannon McKenzie for uh, kind of uh, inspiring this one. Labyrinth. That kids movie in which David Bowie's crotch is clearly outraged. According to Toby Froud, who played baby Toby Williams in the film, the cod piece Bowie wore was supposed to protrude wildly, and does, <laughs> to accentuate the sexual tension in the film in order to elucidate Sarah's intense and fraught coming of age her trial by goblin song, the riddle of youth, all of which is packaged into David Bowie's giant dong jock. How children old enough to remember the 80s made sense of such a display of problematic dongery is why young Toby Froud, to this day, makes his own puppets, goblins, trolls, and other servile nightmares have no very discernible need for pants. Hello again, <laughs> poem number nine, uh, our prompt for this one was journey, one word, which like the last poem, um, I think brings to mind two things, uh, the idea of a journey, which, uh, you know, point A to point B, uh, and obstacles along the way, or the band journey. Um, I'm not going to tell you which way I went. You're just going to have to uh, figure that out, which won't be very hard once you hear the poem. Um, poem number nine, cover number nine, Journey. At times it can be hard to believe you'll get to where you're going. When young folk around you reach those interesting ages, you recall when you were that free, forgetting with age that when you were young, you were never, you, blah, 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 blah. I'm gonna start again. <laughs> At times it can be hard to believe you'll get to where you're going. When young folk around you reach those interesting ages, you recall when you were that free, forgetting with age that when you were young, you never really felt free. With age, you start to feel like a book you're reading, half aware of your past, like the reading mind remembers what happened in the book by feeling the pages accumulating between your index and thumb, a story of inches. Our ages stack, so the story can't be so easily recalled, certainly not rebooted. Maybe learned from, but how many lessons or journeys really codify who we are? And might become next. Who we are becomes a book on display, so deep it stretches round the block, round universes, and the universe is of course on its own journey too. Can't believe in itself, so it forms us for sex, music, story, and song, and in return we do the universe a giant favor, as best we can, we don't stop believing. Yeah, you say that all the time. <laughs> I love it. Um, this is poem and cover number 10. Number 10. If you can believe it. Um, where's the prompt for me to read? Uh, 
Can you tell we're starting to slip? Oh, there. Yeah. So the prompt is 1,000 years of planning will be possible in five seconds with a quantum, quantum computer. We're doomed. So I'm sure you can imagine what the title is. We're doomed. Oh, yes, my babies. We are certainly doomed. But when were we not? How many ends have we lived through? How much death has succeeded in pushing how much life? Premature doom, well, therein lies the real Shakespearean stuff. Why seemingly everyone of sound mind is riddled with anxiety and despair and a hard road ahead, hard farmer's fields, hard air, hard oceans, hard shores. I'm sorry. I just can't help but wonder, with all that computing power, how still invincible the big riddle will be. Hello go. all. I'm sure you're waking up just to hear this. This is poem number 11 and cover number 11. She's adding a final detail. Uh, the, prompt, the prompt for this was uh, truly impossible. One of the truly, truly impossible poems. Uh, write a poem explaining NFTs. So I took it quite literally. And this poem is called NFTs. Explain. According to Wikipedia, a non-fungible token, NFT, is a unit of data stored on a digital ledger called a blockchain that certifies a digital asset to be unique and therefore not interchangeable. NFTs can be used to represent items such as photos, videos, audio, and other types of digital files. Access to any copy of the original file, however, is not restricted to the buyer of the NFT. While copies of these digital items are available for anyone to obtain, NFTs are tracked on blockchains to provide the owner with a proof of ownership that is separate from copyright. According to Merriam-Webster, a sucker is a person who is easily cheated or deceived. Okay. Unprecedented, never been done before to, to today in the last 12 hours. Uh, why am I holding my phone like I'm going to read something from it? Yeah. It's, we've been up too long. Um, this poem is poem number and cover number 12. Halfway, Can I maybe. explain first? Halfway. In case Katie comes in part way. The prompt is betrayal. All in caps. Um, okay, so my thought for this cover was to refuse to provide a cover. Um, so I have nothing to show for myself for this one. Although we do have a book that is all this poem. Um, so everything on the inside is just the betrayal poem. And there's no cover. So go ahead. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. This poem is called... Betrayal. <laughs> betrayal. The betrayal of the city to the citizen. The betrayal of the citizen to the process. The betrayal of the process to the outcome. The betrayal of the outcome to the merit. The betrayal of the merit to the legacy. The betrayal of the legacy to the ego. The betrayal of the ego to progress. The betrayal of progress to the mistake, 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 mistake. Sound of the bell, it is 8 o'clock. 
AM. This is phone number <laughs> thir 13? 13. 13. And cover number 13. Um, the prompt for this one, we won't mention the second part of the prompt because it'll kind of give away who it is, um, but which we're trying not to do, even though I believe I've said this person's name <laughs> on the live stream. Uh, so, foisted, just the word. So just the word foisted. Uh, this person has been thinking a lot about this word of late. Uh, so says they in their prompt. So, um, again, as with most of the poems, uh, you can guess what the title is. Foisted. Our tiny minds can remember such large things. Hundreds of decimal places beyond pi, phone numbers decades old, every property name and value of every monopoly square. But how about you tell me how the last season of the last show you watch on Netflix ended? Having a hard time? I have a theory. Our minds were only meant to hold so many stories. Our minds bifurcated from the beasts because of story. But back then there were few narratives to know beyond why the, wi why the wild grass moves without the wind why to keep a fire going, why we should mark where a member of the tribe fell with stones. Most of the writing's simple, terrifying. There's just too much fucking content. It's finally time in our long pink evolution to change again, grow the mind, maybe this time for the last time. So foist upon me the new flesh that beeping and booping soil, soul, sorry, foist upon me the future already, that taboo microchip that might someday undo humankind, but that for now might make enough room in the pink to let me sleep. Some of the prompts we got, in case you don't know already, were very personal and we didn't want to read the whole thing. Uh, so we just kind of, for the longer ones or any of this sort, we highlighted portions. I just highlighted like one line. I don't know if you want more than that. <coughs> um, I just wrote, or highlighted a piece of work that looked at suicide and how it affects the people you leave behind. Yeah, that's Was there more context you wanted out of that? There is like a lot, but it's very specific to the person. Yeah, exactly. No, okay. Um, okay, poem number 14 is called Keep Your Life Alive. When your life is turned upside down, it becomes a lot less your own life. It starts to become more the persons who tried to flip you. Suicide is difficult to imagine because there is nothing after but the folk who find you there and the decades of dealing with one short, never-ending moment. Most of us have been there, rope or razor or a great height. I have sympathy enough for all of you, but for those left with the long thought of your final action, that light stays on forever, long after you've turned yours out. Such profoundly tragic theater leaves the Yorick in your hands without a curtain. You may crave a cease to all this existence, but you just pass it on. Pain being the one human thing that never really ends, it just goes to seed. Camus famously penned, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. And I agree, and I will keep agreeing.
Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is poem and cover number 15? 15. Correct. Uh, and the prompt was... Well, that's a good one. Yeah, it is a good one. How is the weather actually? A poem about weather in which weather is in no way used as a metaphorical representation of anyone's internal state or any larger narrative. Weather for weather's sake. So, my poem is called The Weather. It is 9.14 a.m. on the morning of September 25th, 2021. Outside, it is currently 9 degrees Celsius and partly cloudy. That is the weather. <laughs> poem and cover number 15. Poem number 15. <laughs> cover number 15 is in transit. Uh, this is the first one, I think, of the experience that I'm not that happy with. And it's just because I'm very tired. And I didn't... Yeah, it's... I don't know. It's a poem. It reminds me of like the keyboards poems that I'd write when I'm just like, all right, maybe this is the last one of the night. <laughs> um, but the nap I just had uh, seems to be working. But yes, we are obviously uh, starting to struggle at this point. Uh, did I say 15 already? I think I did. Uh, so the prompt is. Your dad is seriously ill. Your family is at each other's throats. Your partner just left you. You lost your job. It's a pandemic and a heat wave to boot, but somehow you are having the best day ever. So, as with almost all the poems, as I always say pretty much every time, excuse me, uh, you can guess what the title is. The title is Best Day Ever. And I think you'll see what I was maybe trying to do here. Uh, anyway. Your dad is seriously ill. When you told the florist the same, he gave you the flowers for free. Your family is at each other's throats, but they haven't talked this much to each other in years. Your partner just left you, but left behind their turntable and all the records. <laughs> you lost your job. But day jobs are fresh hell. It's a pandemic, but you qualified for recovery benefit checks from the Gov, which works out fine after losing your job. There's a heat wave, so you take your dog down to the creek to splash around in cool, shallow water, which of course is fucking adorable. <laughs> Trying to keep all of this, good and no good, in perspective on the way home, you step in gum, but by golly, it just peels right off like it was meant for someone else. You toss the gum into the ditch, which a bird then uses to build its nest to raise its family, allowing that bird family, even in this heat, to stick together. Because of you, it somehow all works out. The sky is suddenly full of song. All this joy rained from pain. The poem does it no justice. Your best day ever. Okay, poem and cover number six, seventeen. 17. Yay. So, Alicia is holding up two things there, as you will see, because our prompt was please write a sonnet based on this receipt. So, that's the picture of the receipt. Sub request if that's not impossible enough as told from the perspective of a raccoon. <laughs> Feel free to use the words, the numbers, and or anything else that the receipt's materiality may suggest to you. So, if you heard me complaining earlier all morning about this, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just because I haven't written an iambic pentameter in, like, 15 years. 
uh, and I wasn't about to start today again. Um, so this is a this is sonnet ish, which is represented in the title, but the title is a representation of the effort and frustration, but also a little wink to the character in the poem. It's called Rocky Sonnet. <laughs> Surely a document from the gods, thought the London street raccoon. Its script is rather odd. Surely God is coming soon. There seems to be an order here, one surely I don't know. My little paws trembling with fear. When will this good God show? It's black and white and like my kind is flattened on the road. Some furry saviors in my mind, I hear it coming close. Then just like that, religion known, car does its trick, raccoon mind blown. <laughs> the sound of the bell is one o'clock. This is poem and cover number... Fifteen? Uh, Eighteen. Eight, oh, wow, way up. <laughs> Eighteen, apparently. And the prompt for this is... People confide in me, I don't know why. They tell me things that I don't ask for. All I can do is listen, but why me? So, in the rich tradition that I've established here tonight, the title of the poem is... Why me? If not you, then who? But if you're still raw about it, all these folks confiding the unasked for, show them such fierce and brave kindness. Hug the fuckers till they explode. So, this poem, I feel, requires some explanation um, and some excuses. Excuse me? Uh, well, it's a, as I was saying to Alicia, if you caught that, as I was writing it, it's, it, it's made me feel a bit icky to write. Um, so I'm actually just going to give you, which I would normally never do, I'm going to give you the kind of conceit of the poem before I read it, just because I think it's important that the person who submitted this prompt isn't surprised by the quotes that I'm using. So the, the, the poem is comprised entirely of quotes. The only word that I added is and, uh, and you'll see where that is. Um, it's comprised entirely of quotes basically by like the most monstrous human beings uh, some to the highest possible like upper echelons of devils and then some lower level thugs and then a couple fictional villains just to kind of fix things up um, so I mean if you really wanted to as you're paying attention you could google the quote and then be like oh my god he included a quote by that person Yes, I did, uh, because I like the idea of, um, what was the first part that you highlighted? Read that the again. The right words said in the right place at the right time can literally change the course of history. So that can be interpreted positively and negatively. Of course, like Martin Luther King, um, you know, had the power to change the world for the better. Uh, rhetoric, uh, when used correctly, um, and by correctly I mean uh, well despite uh, virtue, is 
I think happens more often and uh, can have a much more uh, devastating and immediate effect as we know if you watch uh, Hitler's speeches or um, horrific, terrible people. And especially nowadays, um, rhetoric is being used to justify all kinds of things. Truth is always somewhere in the middle, but people are getting away with saying outrage is garbage and even being celebrated for it. So there's a Trump quote in here as well, just to go along with that theme. Um, there's a Doug Ford quote. There's a so again, some lower level thugs, but some major players in the evil game. Uh, Before you start, Naomi says, wow, no pressure. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. That was the other thing that, you know, write a poem that will change the course of, the, of you know, the world or has the potential to. Um, I try to do that in all the poems I write yeah. to a certain degree, but wow. I think... Uh, you know, that's an especially tall order when you're under time constraints. So this was something that I thought would be an interesting piece. And I will read it now. It's called Under Word Control. Words build bridges into unexplored regions. Countless millions who have walked this earth before us have gone through this. So this is just an experience we all share. The hardest choices require the strongest wills. I believe in one thing only, the power of the human will. He who stops being better stops being good. And impossible is a word found only in the dictionary of fools. Don't let the wish grow cold. Everything will probably never be okay, but we have to try for it. I make the best cherry cheesecake ever. I would give myself an A+. Plus. Okay, that bell means it's 3 o'clock. And this is poem and cover number 21? 20? 20. 20. Uh, the prompt for this um, was the first prompt we got. Yeah. A very exciting one because it was very specific, extremely specific. So it made it very challenging, but it was also, uh, in my opinion, one of the more interesting ones we got. Um, so I'll just, I might just read the whole thing. Yeah, it was nice. Short version An evocative poem on the beauty of piatic numbers. Longer version. One of my university math professors always, once per course, got us to write a poem about the math we were learning for bonus marks on a test or assignment. These ended up being almost universally silly because it's really hard to translate the type of beauty that mathematicians see in mathematics into poetic words. So my prompt slash challenge would be to write a serious evocative poem that captures the beauty of one of my favorite structures slash areas of mathematics, the piatic numbers. Well, prompter, I can already tell you that uh, I may have failed in that task, but uh, it's a poem and it's about, it's kind of maybe about piatic numbers, because even after doing, uh, I, I couldn't do buckets of research, no, buckets. Uh, buckets. I couldn't do a lot of research because uh, time constraints. So I just kind of, the research I did, I just kind of tried to pull out some kind of poetic things uh, about piatic numbers without being able to wrap my head at all around what they actually are. So poem number 20 is called Building the Tower, which is a term that has something to do with piatic numbers. <laughs> the distance between numbers, the fact that that's even a thing, seems deeply alien. These buckets of numbers, these rooms, are possibly infinite to the left of the point, and decidedly less so to the right. Though as far as I can tell, you need both right and left-leaning numbers to build the tower. Draw your democratic metaphors accordingly. 
The addicts believe 82 is much closer to 1 than 81, which might seem like the politic of the right, 2 plus 2 equals 5, and on and on. Though the addicts have been dubbed leftist numbers by the rich, their strangeness largely superficial, I know to you and I that none of it makes much sense. But isn't it comforting that the language of the universe leans into the poetic to back up its power, though there may be a few holes in my bucket? Sound of the bell, it is four o'clock. Um, this is poem and cover number 21. 21. 21. And where is our prompt? Wait, Last I can read page. this one exactly. <laughs> yes. The prompt is Dentures made of whale baleen. Baleen, I looked up the pronunciation of the word, that's how you say it, according to the internet. The internet. Um, baleen, so baleen is um, kind of like a whale's teeth, if you will. They use it to strain, it's actually made of bone. I think a lot of people think it's made of some like, I don't know. Fleshy tissue? Yeah. Um, but it's actually bone, and so they just take in a large amount of water and then use the baleen to strain uh, out various sea life, which they eat. Okay, so um, this one is called, uh, we decided to go with, we're not going to say who did the prompt, of course, because we haven't been doing that, but uh, we know this person, they're a bit of a silly person. Uh, so we decided to go with a silly, or I decided to go with a silly poem. Mine's pretty silly too, I'm going to close that one. Oh, right, yeah. And this actually isn't even a poem, but you'll see. It's called A Whale of a Groaner. An aging whale walks into a whale dentist's office to get some new whale dentures and says to the whale dentist, I think this time I want to go the natural route with my new dentures. I've been looking to believe. Well, that's going to be a problem, replied the whale's dentist. Why? asked the confused elder whale. Well, the dentist said, you're a whale. You'll never believe. 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 Groner is right. <laughs> I'm literally here all week. <laughs> Sound of the bell. It's 5 p.m. This is poem number 22 and cover number 22. 22 is right, right? Uh, yeah. Must, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Poem and cover number 22. Um, the prompt for this was by someone who knows uh, my work quite well. And. Uh, the prompt goes, my impossible prompt for Justin is to write a celebratory poem about Peterborough. Sure. And since it's a celebratory poem, let's also require some alliteration a la GM Hawk Hopkins. Roll rock, high road roaring down, pitch past pitch of grief, etc. So I also, after a recent local event, um, which you'll know when I read the poem, um, I received an email from the person who sent this prompt, and they they decided to uh, let me off the hook by providing me a loophole in the definition of celebration or celebrate. So in order to make this, uh, this is not a poem, this is a protest or a, pronunci or a, what's a pronouncement. Um, I've decided to include the definition of celebrate for clarity. Definite, or this is called Celebrating Peterborough. Definition of celebrate. A, and this is not the definition we'll be using. 
to perform a sacrament or solemn ceremony publicly and with appropriate rites. B. To honor an occasion such as a holiday, especially by solemn ceremonies or by refraining from ordinary business. On behalf of 24 hours, poems, chapbooks, I, Justin Million, have elected not to write a poem for this prompt, to refrain from my ordinary business of writing poems for the citizens of Peterborough, to honor the occasion of local vlogger Michelle Ferreri being elected to the highest political office in Peterborough, Nogajiwanong. Thank you, Justin Million. This, the sign of the bell, sorry, let me start that again, the sign of the bell at 6 p.m. Excuse me. This is the penultimate poem and, uh, and cover, and it is uh, my poem, oh, with a prompt, Jesus. Can you tell? I'm We're really slipping. We're really. Well, I just started having a couple devs. Um, where is the. Where is the prompt? Oh. So the prompt for this one was Words on a Stone. That's the prompt. Uh, so the poem I wrote for this is called tombstoned and I will read it now tombstone Justin Million born July 19th 1983 died July 19th 2035 hoping that wherever you are now the Toronto Maple Leafs have finally won a first round series last time At the tone of the bell, it is approximately almost seven. Um, <laughs> last poem, last cover. Prompt. Prompt. Thank you. It's in the poem, though. I don't know uh, if you should read it this time. Okay, yeah, you're right. We're going to break right all in. the rules at the yeah, very end. Yeah, we're going to keep breaking the rules. This poem is called Writer's Tears. Where does grief go when you're not feeling it? to bloom. Where does joy go when you grieve to seed? Woo! That's it. We did it!